And everybody said, Amen. Good evening, everyone. And the Lord bless us today to make us a blessing to all the people in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind you that this is for leadership development. And it's not like a crusade. And it's not like even Monday Bible study. And it's not like a Saturday workers meeting. Here we are to develop leaders. And we need to know the foundation of our leadership as well as the strengths we need to get from the Lord so you'll be with your Bible and you will be willing to sink in and soak in the word of God and then it will change your life it will change your leadership and once it does that the church will be better and the world will be evangelized so that's why we're here today prepare your mind prepare your heart for all that God has for us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for the development session. Thank you for all our brethren, our leaders, our overseers, our pastors, our leaders in every section, every area. Gather together all over the city, all over the state, in Lagos here, all over Nigeria and beyond, Nigeria, all over Africa and beyond. We're asking, Lord, that you speak your word to us today and strengthen us in the work and make us to see the way forward in Jesus name Amen. help us Lord to be the leaders who have called us to be Amen. with faith fortitude, courage fearlessness, we move on to do the work you have given us to do Amen. be glorified in our lives, in our ministries in the work you have given us to do Amen. in Jesus mighty name we pray God bless you. You can sit down. As you know, in Lagos here, we just finished our weekend crusade uh, last uh, weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And now we are doing follow-up. And we want to do the follow-up thoroughly so that by the grace of God, there will be growth in the personal lives of the converts who have just come to know the Lord. But we understand that the growth in those babes in Christ would uh, come through the growth of the leadership and of the pastors and of the men and the women who are leading these uh, young people, these young converts, and are leading them to know the Lord more. And uh, the same thing goes for all our states where we have been holding crusades. Uh, the follow-up is very important. And we need to understand it's for the growth of the people. We're coming to First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. I want to underline that word, growth, in your mind as well as your ministry. That you want the babes in Christ. You want the members in the church. And you want the ministers in the church, the workers, those who are under your leadership, you want them to grow. That brings joy to the heart of Christ. That brings satisfaction, fulfillment to the heart of Christ. We're told in Isaiah chapter 53, concerning Christ, about Christ, what he has done, and what satisfaction he would have when he sees that the effect of the atonement, the effect of the sacrifice that he did on the cross of Calvary, is actually yielding a fruit. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, it says, And he, referring to Christ, shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. When those converts are seen, they have come to know the Lord. They are abiding in the Lord. They are staying in the Lord. And they are growing in the Lord. They love the Lord and they are obeying the word of God. It brings joy and satisfaction to Christ. He shall see the travail of his soul and then shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. That's what the Lord has raised us up so that we can minister to the growth of the church, 
the babes in Christ and the members who have been there all the time for maturity. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. You see here, it's giving us responsibility. It's giving us uh, the ministry to minister to the lives of a people. And it says, and it gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Look at the reason for that. For the perfecting of the saints. That is, they grow up, they mature, and they move on to perfection. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. As say uh, these uh, new converts are coming to the Lord, or they've just come to the Lord, we raise them up for the work of the ministry. You might know, you cannot tell whether there is a soul, a Paul, that became converted. And before this conversion, he already knows the scriptures. Before this conversion, already zealous. Before this conversion, already laboring for God in the way he thought he labor for God. But now he's seen the light. Now he's born again. And he comes into the kingdom. You're not going to treat a such a convert and such a person like, um, you know, somebody who did not know anything. For example, a teacher is just got converted. For example, um, an, a musician is just God converted. He knows all the music already, and he knows a lot of things, and he can use that to the glory of God. Or maybe somebody who is a nurse, a doctor, a manager, or somebody who is a director has just got converted. We're not just going to put them in line with all the other people thinking, okay, they're all new converts. We train them and teach them and develop them to grow the way they ought to grow. So you understand, the Lord has raised us up as ministers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the defining of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See what the Lord is telling us. He's saying we ought to grow. And he's saying that ministers will grow, members will grow, and the goal of that growth and the aim of that growth and the target for that growth is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then it comes on to those who are young in the faith. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. That's why we're training them. That's why we're following up on them. That's why we're helping them to grow in the Lord, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in which to deceive. Look at verse 15. But speaking the truth, how? I said, how? You know, but it's not just speaking in love. We are speaking the truth in love. You're speaking the sound doctrine of the word of God. You're leading them because you love them. It says, speaking the truth in love may, what's the next word there? Grow up into him. Grow up into him. And then it says, in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, he wants uh, all the converts and he wants you, of course, to, to grow into him. That is into Christ. And then he says, in all things. In Second Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 17 and verse 18. Second Peter chapter 3. We're reading from verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away by the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. And then it goes on to say in verse 18, but what? Tell me out loud. Grow in grace. Grow in grace. There are people that uh, think that the grace of God only saves us. And we're saved by grace through faith. That's the end. No, not at all. There's a lot the grace of God can do in our lives. And it says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord. It's saying, you grow, number one, in grace. Number two, you grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him, the glory now and forever. Amen. Growth causes joy in heaven and on earth. A parent has just, uh, you know, uh, brought, uh, they brought a uh, child into the world and they're happy. And then when that child is growing uh, mentally 
and growing physically and growing spiritually. It brings joy to the parents. You've established a business and that business is progressing and, and growing. You are happy or you're doing whatever, whatever you're doing. And you can see the progress and there is a growth. It makes us happy. So growth causes joy in heaven and causes joy on earth. Christ rejoices and is satisfied on the birth or in the birth of spiritual babes into the kingdom. Angels even rejoice for repentance and for the conversion of sinners. Growth honors Christ and growth honors and appreciates the atonement and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The growth of members in the church and the growth of ministers in the church glorifies God. The character and the stature of Christ is the aim, is the goal, is the target for our growth. And since we're not fully, completely, entirely, practically, exactly like Christ in character, in maturity, in perfection, in understanding, in stature, and in everything that we do, we need to now move ahead and say we will grow. I see growing people here. Amen. We will grow in Jesus' name. Amen. There are the message tonight is Christ's passionate desire. Christ's passionate, passionate, passionate desire for our steady growth. Christ's passionate desire for our steady growth. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the food for spiritual growth in the ministry. We feed on the word of God, on the meal from heaven, on the manna from heaven. The food for spiritual growth in the ministry. Number two, the faith for the soaring growth of ministers. Soar. That's to climb up to soar, to fly, and to so fly high that those on the ground might not even be able to see you. The faith for the soaring growth of ministers. Number three, the fruits of sustained growth towards maturity. As we're moving on to maturity, the evidence of that and the practical marks of that moving towards maturity. The fruits of sustained growth towards maturity. Point number one. Tell me your number one there. The food for spiritual growth in ministry. As we know, even children know this, the food and water are necessary for existence here on the earth. Necessary for our physical growth. For our health, food and water are necessary. For our strength, food and water are necessary. For our happiness, food and water are necessary. For our concentration, if you have a work to do, to concentrate on that work, your stomach is not biting you. You are not terribly hungry. You cannot concentrate. And you are not so thirsty that you cannot concentrate. You are well hydrated. And you understand that food and water are necessary beyond our description. And for the work we do, for the assignment we have, for any duty we have, food and water are necessary and for progress, and for life in its fullness. When we talk of food, we're talking of balanced diet, and we're talking of clean, good drinking water. Because if the water is not clean, if the water is not all right, if it's uh, poisoned one way or the other, it can give us disease. And if it is uh, food that is poisoned one way or the other, it can make us unhealthy and make us sick. Therefore, the food we're talking about in the physical and the natural should be clean, should be good, and these are essential for desirable growth. In fact, life, the whole of life, depends on them, on food and water. You transfer that, you translate that to the spiritual. 
that the food would take spiritually. The meals would take spiritually. The words were here spiritually. These affect our spiritual lives. They make us either to grow or to be stagnant or to look back, backslide, or to be weakened. That's the reason why we need to understand the food we have for spiritual growth. We're coming back to that first Peter again, chapter 2. In chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, wherefore laying aside all malice. You see, if we're sick, even if we're eating, we might not be growing properly. That's why it says spiritually now, if we're going to grow spiritually, it says we have to look at our lives and we look at all these new converts that have come. They've come into the kingdom. It says they lay aside all malice and all guile. What's guile? I say, what's guile? Deception, lying, hypocrisy. We lay all that aside. And hypocrisies in the plural and envies like jealous, jealousy and all evil speaking. After we lay all that aside, that means now we're ready to grow. The thing that will hinder growth or limit growth has been taken away. You look at your life too. It's wonderful to come to the Monday Bible study, come to Tuesday leadership development session, and come for Saturday meeting, and come for the Thursday too, and in Sunday services. But if all these things are in our lives, and we're just hearing the word of God, it's like eating but you're sick. It's like eating but something. It's making the food you eat not have the effect and the impact in your life. And we need to check up our lives. Sometimes we'll be saved for a long time. Some of these things come in, uh, like in our families. They come in like that. Like guile, husband deceiving wife, and wife deceiving husband. Like in our places of work, there's a kind of deception, and uh, we're living like a hide and a seek um, kind of life. And then we're hearing the word of God, and the word of God we're hearing is not bearing any fruit. It's not uh, having any effect on us. Therefore, even we as ministers, even we as leaders, even we as overseers and pastors, it says that if we're going to have real spiritual growth, and we're going to soar, that we need to lay all these aside, laying aside how many kinds of uh, malice, you know, diplomatic malice, you lay that aside. The direct malice, you lay that aside. And the antagonistic kind of malice, you lay that aside. And the one that we learn from the world, the tradition of the world, we lay all that aside. All kinds of malice, it says, laying aside all malice and all guile. If we check up our lives, you might discover that deception is coming in. You might discover that, uh, you know, in make-believe, it's like you're living a life that is not real and it's not transparent. And the Lord is saying, if we're going to grow as children of God and all these uh, new babes in Christ, if they're going to grow, they need to lay aside all guile and all hypocrisies hypocrisies. You know, sometimes uh, you know, your place of work, you are doing something, you don't want your boss to know, and you act as if you are so innocent, and you act as if you are, you know, you are so dutiful and faithful, and yet there are things that are under the carpet that you wish they would not know. It says, we as Christians will lay all that aside. If all that we're hearing is going to benefit us, we lay aside all hypocrisies and all envy all envies. You know, there are times, uh, you know, some ministries will envy others. It may be the choir that will envy the ushers, the ushers envy the choir, and this one envies the other one. Or those who are men, they envy the women, the women envy uh, the, the others. It says we lay all that aside so that there will be transparency in our ministry, there will be transparency in our lives, and everything we do, we do to the glory of God, and there is uh, not like, you know, we're playing pranks of the ministry and it says all evil speaking. After laying all that aside now it says as newborn babes and if this is good for the newborn babes I think it's good for fathers and mothers. It's good for pastors and leaders. It's good for preachers and it's good for everyone. It says as newborn babes that we desire the sincere milk we desire 
You know, if you desire something, it shows. Like you come to the Bible study on Monday and there's a desire in your heart. In the old, in the good old days, when coming to the Bible study, we'll be running to get to the Bible study. We do not want to miss any sentence, any statement of the word of God because there was a desire in our heart. But you know, if there's no desire now, you do it like duty. You do it like, well, I've always done it. If I'm not there, they will ask of me. And uh, so if I don't go, somebody will check up on me and say, why were you not there? It's like we just come. The same thing when you come to the Tuesday meeting like this, you know that something is coming and it's going to make your life better, make your ministry better, and you have a desire. And then the same thing we're passing on. But you know, if we don't have the desire, and if we don't have the passion and, and the zeal to take in the word of God, the people who are leading, they will understand. They know that, you know, we're cold, we're lethargic, we're lukewarm, and, you know, somebody is uh, pushing us to do something. They also will get that kind of attitude. But when we who are pastors, we have the desire to take in the word of God. It will splash on, it will spill over to those new converts, and it says as newborn babes that should desire the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. I pray well grow. I said I pray well grow. Then it says in verse 3, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you have tasted the grace of God, you don't just stop there, you move on, so that you will grow in the faith and grow in the things of God. The food, look at uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word by, tell me, every word. Well, that means that if we're going to grow, the balanced diet of the word of God is that everything in the word of God we listen to. It's not like I only listen to this doctrine. I don't like that other doctrine. I only listen to this teaching. This other one kind of makes me afraid as if I don't know what they're going to say in that doctrine. Everything will lead by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And as we're teaching Teaching the young converts, those who have just come in, uh, we're not uh, kind of picking and choosing and saying we cannot teach them this or teach them that. We're teaching them uh, uh, the whole word of God. When Jesus said it is written, where did he quote that from? Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 3. Here is uh, the word that Jesus Christ quoted. And uh, he applied that and overcame the devil. And when you quote the word of God and you stand on the word of God, believing the word of God, and actually cherishing that word of God, you'll overcome the devil in Jesus' name. Yeah. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger, and he fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. But why? He made them suffer, but why? He made them hungry, but why? He humbled them, but why? You see, all the things you might miss in your life, all the things that the Lord might uh, wisely take away from your life, that you say, why did he take that away? Why did I miss that? Look at the purpose now. It says in the middle of that verse that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only. The way many people work is like man would just live to eat by bread only. And the way many people, you know, they go for this degree, they go for that degree, they go for that degree, and they don't have anything to do with the work of the Lord at all. It's like man is just uh, to earn money only to eat. And the way people spend their lives, and they don't think about eternity, they don't think about their spiritual lives. It's like this is only what we're living for, but God himself said, and Jesus quoted this, that he might make thee know that man does not lay by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. 
That is, every word of God, that's what we're to uh, cherish and that's what we're to take in uh, in our own personal lives. And also as we're teaching these uh, young people, we get them to, uh, to love the word of God, to desire all the benefits of the word of God at this time that they have just come into the kingdom. Look at the attitude of Job. It tells us in chapter 23, Job chapter 23 and verse 12. It says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I know you knew that before. You've read that before. But you know what Job is saying? Job is saying, yes, I've sustained some losses. My work has been affected. It says, uh, when you look at my family, all the children have been affected. Where are they now? And when you look at, you know, the, his environment, even his health and everything, it says, yes, I've lost a lot of things personally and then in the family and every. But you know what? I have not gone back from the commandment of his lips. You see, there are people, if there's a little challenge, then they say, I, I don't feel like, you know, I don't feel happy. How can you go to the Bible study without being happy? That's the time to go to the Bible study because it will bring the joy of the word and the joy of the Lord in the word will become the strength of your life in Jesus' name. You see, I, I just uh, sustained this injury, I had this challenge, I had that, this challenge, and in fact, now I'm not very well. How can I go to uh, hear the word of God? That's the time to go and hear the word of God because the word of God will change all your circumstances in Jesus' name. It says, Yes, I've gone through a lot, yes, I'm suffering, but it says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his leaves. I have esteemed the words of his mouth tell me what's necessary food breakfast what's necessary food lunch what's necessary food supper you see there are people they say uh, you know i can't read the word of god now i can't go to bible study my wife you've not finished the meal we're going to miss uh, you know the bible study today because if i don't eat i cannot go out if i don't eat i cannot get this done if i don't eat i don't get that done but hey you go to work when the food is late, you leave the food by, at, back at home, and then you go to work. It's only the Bible study we cannot go, and it's only the spiritual things we cannot do, and it is only what will help us to prepare for heaven. That's what we cannot concentrate on because there's no food. But Job is saying, I have esteemed the words of his mouth. The words of the book, the words in this book of God, I've esteemed that more than my necessary food. I pray that the Lord will so touch our lives and he will turn us around and will live the way he wants us to live in Jesus' name. The word of God will become very important very essential for you, more than your necessary food. And as we're laboring and working for what to eat and what to put on, we we'll labor more for the things of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Understanding. But you know, if uh, we pastors are going to feed the church, the newcomers we are talking about now, and the members of the church, and the people that are listening to us, if we're going to feed them with knowledge, we must have that knowledge ourselves. We must dig into the word of God, know the word of God, believe the word of God, and we're not just reading only some, you know, familiar passages all the time, but we go through the word of God, and then we are fed ourselves. After we are fed, then we'll be able to feed the people of God or the knowledge of the truth of the word of God. And then there's a verse I want to point your attention to in Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19, reading there from verse 2. Proverbs chapter 19, reading there from verse 2. It says also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. If you make that personal, that my soul be without knowledge, it is not good. And these uh, newcomers that have just come into the kingdom, that their souls be without knowledge, it is not good. Our church, that the soul of the church, the center of the church, the key people in the church, that they be without knowledge, it is not good. You understand? If you think about the body, 
The soul is the very center. It's what keeps the life there. And that soul at the very center of your life needs the knowledge of the word of God. And it says that the soul be without knowledge. It is not good. And you think of a person who is a key leader in the church. That's the soul of the church in that locality. And that soul... At that center, that nucleus, that foundation, that source, that one that everybody is looking up to is without knowledge, without the knowledge of the word of God. And it says it's not good for him and it's not good for that local church and it's not good for the church in general. We'll have the knowledge of the word of God. I said we'll have the knowledge of the word of God and we'll feed the people with that knowledge of the word of God in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 23, we're reading from verse 4. It tells us in verse 4, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. Feed them. And as the Lord has raised us up to be shepherds and pastors and overseers, it says, we're to feed the people. It says, we shall feed them and they shall fear no more. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. You know, in our lives, uh, you know, there are many people that fear a lot of things. They fear in the day, they fear in the night. They fear because of the news, uh, you know, they're hearing. And they fear because of some things coming from the village. They fear because of uh, the situation around them, insecurity. And they fear because of the traditions, of the occult and everything. Uh, and all these fears in the word of God that will drive everything away. They fear in the church, they fear outside the church, they fear in the office, they fear at home, they fear on the road and they fear everywhere. And their lives are pinned down and pegged down and bogged down because of fear and the fear of man brings his near but it says we will feed the people with the word of God all their fears will vanish away we we'll tell them of the promises of God, of the power of God, of the goodness of God. We we'll tell them of the mercy of God. We we'll tell them, like we learned uh, yesterday, as long as, you know, you're still doing the work of God and there's still something to do, your hour to go has not come. And no matter their conspiracy, no matter what is happening uh, behind the scene and behind the curtain anywhere, your life is secured. And once you know that, you understand that you are fed with the word of God. And the same thing you are telling those new converts. Those new converts have a lot of things they are fearing. They fear this, they fear this, some superstition, some tradition, and some curses and whatever. And you go there, everything is broken in Jesus' name. We feed them, and it says, they shall fear no more, and not be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking wonderful. Neither shall they be lacking. I'm going to make that personal, neither shall I be lacking. I said, neither shall I be lacking. It says, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. When you hear the word of God, know that word of God. Believe that word of God. Soak in that word of God. And you're living by that word of God. You have confidence in that word of God. There'll be no lack in your life in Jesus' name. And you're not going back to the Old Testament. It happened to Job. It happened to this. It happened to that. Now Christ has come. And because he has come, he was giving us his only begotten son. How much more shall he not give us all the other things we need? all things are available for you now because the Lord has a sacrifice and he has paid the final price everything we need for soul for spirit for body for time and for eternity for us and for heaven everything is now provided and there'll be no lack in Jesus name I said there'll be no lack in Jesus name and everything we have lacked, God will supply everything. Now we feed the church. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, we're looking at chapter 20, verse 28. You understand? Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, we're to feed the church of the living God with the word of God. It tells us in uh, verse 28, it says, Take it, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. What are we to do? To feed the church of God. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Look at verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the watch of his grace. 
which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So we need the food, the bread, the manna, the word of God. It will make us grow. We will grow. As ministers grow, members will grow. And these uh, newcomers in particular, they will grow in the name of Jesus. We come to point number two now, the faith for the soaring growth of ministers. This is not just um, a little growth, a minor growth, an invisible growth. It grows, you cannot even tell. You know, there are people that, uh, you know, in their Christian lives, you, if you're near them, you cannot tell that they're growing. They might be preachers, but you cannot tell they're growing. They might be ministers, you cannot tell they're growing. If you, st if you had stayed with them like three years ago, and you are staying with them today, and you observe them, you wonder, but they attend all these meetings and they are even preaching, but you cannot see the growth we're talking about. That's the reason why the Lord is telling us that the growth he wants in our lives is not something that, you know, we have to, you know, squeeze and uh, look at it very well and try to make up for something and say, well, I think you are growing in this area. It should be something visible. It should be something real. It should be something that even all the members of your church can tell that they is the growth and our pastor, our minister, our leader is growing and the growth is uh, really rising high. It will begin to happen. Amen. And in every area we are going to grow in Jesus name. Amen. But you know what? How do we understand that we are growing? Because uh, you know it talks about faith. Look at this in uh, first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. One, and we're reading from verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, we're reading here from verse 3. It says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, as it is suitable, because that your faith grows exceedingly. Here Paul the apostle was writing to the Thessalonian believers. He said if there's anything I notice yes I understand you are going through a lot there's a, a kind of persecution and pressure opposition and all those Jews are after you. But I see this. It says your faith grows exceedingly and the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. And so you can tell that this uh, particular church, their faith was growing exceedingly. Let, let's come to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm reading here from verse 6. Hebrews 11. We're reading from verse 6. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, it tells us, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. If there's any area we ought to grow, we ought to grow in the area of our faith. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. Whatever you know, whatever you do, wherever you go, however you're, you're sacrificially serving, if you don't have faith in God, and if your faith is not growing, God is saying, yes, I see what you're doing, but I'm not happy. I see the way you're going, but it's not enough. Because it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We're talking about our faith growing, our faith soaring, our faith by leaves and bound growing. Let me show you an example. Look at verse 8 of uh, this uh, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, no hesitation, he obeyed, no dilly-dallying, he obeyed, no argument, he obeyed implicitly, he obeyed promptly, he obeyed immediately, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Look at that foundation of faith. Look at the next verse. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, 
grow him. Not just that as an initial faith. And then he went on and on. And he sojourned there. That's growing faith. And then come to verse 10. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He lifted up his horizon. He lifted up his mind. And is looking beyond the land of Canaan. He's even looking for another place now, which is heaven. Look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up. Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up is only begotten son. Look at that. Look at that. At the beginning, it's come out. He came out and then lived here. He lived there. And then he was already looking far, looking far to inherit in heaven. And now we're told that when God said, bring your son, he didn't understand that it wasn't for real. He thought it was for real. He went, he took the wood, he took the fire, he took the knife. He was going to do this for the Lord. But look at verse 18. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that God was able to to raise him up. He had never seen anybody raised up from the dead. He had not, you know, Lazarus being raised has not happened. And all the Jairus daughter had not happened. And yet he believed that God will raise up his son. His faith was growing. I pray your faith will grow. And it will grow. It will soar in Jesus' name. As we talk about a growing faith, you understand, we're talking about a faith. Number one, the faith that saves the faith that saves we're looking in at ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 it says for by grace are you saved through faith by grace are you saved through faith you have that faith you have that initial faith and now you are saved that's where some people remain i'm saved by faith i'm saved by faith we're looking at romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ that's still faith you're growing now because you're justified you're growing now because you have real peace look at verse 2 by whom also we have access by faith into this grace where you will stand and rejoice in the hope of his glory there is joy you're not going about you know it's like you know i'm going through through trouble everybody is against me i don't know what i've done for them i come to church they will not even greet me and this and that and there's no joy but it says i'm saved by faith i'm justified by faith i have peace by faith and i'm rejoicing because of the faith and the confidence i have in the lord and we're living by faith we're looking at hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 now the just shall live by faith how do we live i said how, how do we live you can't go out in the morning because you heard something is happening over there. By faith, you'll go. You can't uh, talk to people about their souls because, you know, I don't know what they'll do. They might reject me. They might, you know, snub me, whatever. By faith, you'll talk. Because it says, the just shall live by faith. That means that every step you take, you are justified, you are saved, you are born again. The faith does not stop at the time you were born again. The faith carries you on. And now you live victoriously by faith. And you live through the day by faith in Jesus' name. It says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, when people draw back, it's because there's no faith. It says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back onto perdition. Looks like that verse is for me. I am not of them. I said I am not of them that draw back onto perdition. I am of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Well, carry on through to the end in Jesus name. And we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 verse 16. Acts chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. It says, and his name, through faith in his name. You see that? His name through faith in his name has made this man strong 
whom you see and know, ye the faith, which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. That means we're saved by faith, we're justified by faith, we live by faith, and we're healed by faith. In uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 18. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, we're reading from verse 18. Here Paul the Apostle is uh, kind of reminding the people of his call. And he said to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness and of sins and inheritance among them which are, tell me, how? Tell me out loud sanctified by faith that is in me in Christ because Christ was talking to him was sanctified by faith were purified by faith and thank God we live the victorious life you see uh, many people would say the temptations that come to me I cannot overcome if you have faith you overcome I said if you have faith you overcome my trial may be different from your trial. Your trial may be different from my trial. But the trial that comes to you, God knows what he has called you to be. He called you to be a preacher. He called you to be a pastor. He called you to be an overseer. He called you to be in that particular place at that particular time for ministry. He knows what will come. He knows what will come. So you cannot say the challenges are too much for me. The challenges, you know, I go through this. I bend that corner. I meet them. I bend that corner. I meet them them because God knew that you have the faith you will overcome and thank God I will overcome every bend of the way I will overcome there is nothing coming out of the pocket of Satan that Christ did not know about and already he prepared you for that and thank God you overcome in the village we overcome in the city we overcome in the office we overcome and if there's anything to overcome in the church, thank God. You know, if we're able to overcome in the village, we're able to overcome in the office, we're able to overcome on the street, tell me, in the church of the living God, if there's anything to overcome, I overcome. I said I overcome. There are people that run away from ministry. They run away from church. They said, I never saw so much trouble in my life in any local church. And I go to that local church, see what I saw. You know, our members are overcoming a lot outside, inside here, under these, in these four walls. Anywhere I go, I am an overcomer. I said I am an overcomer. They overcome occultic people. You will overcome occultic people. They overcome superstitious people. You will overcome superstitious people. And the church, where there's no occultic man, where there's no superstitious man, where there's no traditional man, if it's just this little thing, this little thing, all those idiosyncrasies, I overcome in Jesus' name. I can't hear you. You overcome in Jesus. Look at look at this. First John, first John chapter five, and I'm reading from verse four. First John chapter five. We're reading from verse four. It says, "For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Whatsoever, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. For this, is the victory that overcomes the world. Tell me, even our faith. Thank God, I see overcoming people here today." And you know what? We we'll walk by faith. We're looking at a second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, and we're reading from verse seven. Second Corinthians chapter five, and we're reading from verse seven. Overcomers, overcomers, you are. Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 7. It says, For we walk how? By faith and not by sight. Or walk by faith and not by sight. You know, does this sight you will see? And if you concentrate on that, you'll not do what the Lord has called you to do. I see this, I see this, I see this. I think uh, that person doesn't like me. Maybe, maybe he doesn't like you, but God loves you. 
I think uh, that person is, you know, opposed. Maybe I don't understand. Maybe they're opposed to you, but the Lord is on your side. And God will stand by you. And God is greater than all the men of the world, all the women of the world put together. And because of that, we're walking, we're taking every step, and we're walking by faith and not by sight. And we stand. You will stand. You stand courageously, you stand firmly, and you stand with conviction because the Lord has called you. And you know that the call of God is there. You are going to stand and you're going to be victorious in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Don't shake, stand fast in the faith. Don't move, stand fast in the faith. Don't tremble, stand fast in the faith. Don't be intimidated. Stand fast in the faith. The Lord has called us and the Lord has raised us up and has given us a work to do that no other person can do. Nobody will take your place. And it says, so well, you will watch and you stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men and be strong. You will be strong. I said you will be strong. In fact, it tells us that you, uh, you are steadfast in the faith. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, and we're reading from verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5. Reading from verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, is not a lion, but is as a running lion. Is the picture of a running lion. It seems to be like a running lion. As a running lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Ah, come, come, look at this one. It's saying he's seeking whom he may devour. That means he, he doesn't have the power to devour everyone. I didn't hear you. Because he's seeking. I, I, but he passed uh, by that and said, no, that one is not a candidate for devouring. And then passed along and saw another said, that, that sister, that's a woman. And yet she's so strong and she's so, you know, built all spiritually. That one, I don't want to waste my time with her. He's seeking, he's seeking the people he can get and the people he can crush. And thank God I'm not one of them. I said I'm not one of them. Think about a person. Think about a person that has, you know, been converted for about five years, for ten years. What are you doing? And for 20 years, and all the 10 years and 20 years, you have not built up yourself, and you have not a kind of a, surrounded yourself with the promises of God, with the spiritual barbed wire that no lion can enter in. What have you been doing? If you have not been doing that for 20 years, 30 years, you've been born again, start doing that now so that you become unconquerable. I said you become impenetrable. And then all the surrounding around you, there is a spiritual sign, but there, danger, don't cross over. I said danger, don't cross over. Because all the angels of God are watching over me. I said all the angels of God are watching over me. And all the promises of God are surrounding me. And there is a hedge around me that even Satan was complaining to God. He said, you made the hedge around Job. Old Testament, long ago. How about the New Testament right now? There is a hedge around you. I said there is a hedge around you. And they cannot penetrate. Calvary has happened already. Christ died already. And because of the death of Jesus Christ, you are surrounded with fire. Surrounded with power, surrounded with the Holy Ghost, and the blood of Jesus surrounds you, and no evil thing can enter in. You know, it, we, it's like we're spoiled, uh, you know, our members. Every little thing, they go to prayer warriors. Every little thing, they grow to prayer warriors. And they are not allowed to develop and to hold on to the promises by themselves. Even the leaders uh, uh, coming to this leadership development, something where have a little uh, problem, something should stand there and say, hey, where did this come from? Go back where you came from, and that thing will go back. But, you know, we have spoiled ourselves that, you know, somebody will do the praying for me. Somebody will do the warfare for me. Somebody will do the defending for me. From today, you will stand. I say today, you will stand. Allow me a little story. Is that all right? Where are you? Okay, I won't tell you a story today. You know, when I was young, 
uh, you know, uh, we, we had, um, you know, people in our family that my father will, you know, just take care of them. And one of these days, there was even a girl, and this girl, I can see the picture right now, you know, was sitting in the sitting room, and the girl came back, and the girl was crying, and my daddy said, why are you crying? What happened to you? He said, so and so beat me. Daddy said, so and so, you know how old you are? Get out right now. Go and confront that so and so. And she, the, the girl, because you know my father, he didn't join in the military, but he was militant. And then my father said, go back there. Let me see you confront that person. And that person went out and said, daddy said, I confront you. Now I come to confront you. And then that other person was a boy and put that boy on his back and then came back and my father said that's how to deal with anybody that tries to come against you. And you know, I learned that when I was so young at that time and now the Lord Jesus is saying, I conquered for you at Calvary. And the father is saying, I conquered for you at Calvary. And then, you know, something, a cockroach passes by. And then you're afraid of the cockroach. And you are crying, oh God, oh God, they have come, they have come. And Jesus said, and the Lord said, is the captain of the soul of the soldier. And of them, he says, go back there. And then you go back there, kill that cockroach. I said, kill that cockroach. You're free in Jesus' name. Don't come and be looking for, you know, looking for, uh, you know, prayer warriors and this one and this one. You will conquer by yourself. Any member of deeper life, a man, a woman, a minister in deeper life, a man, a woman, were more than conquerors. Am I talking to conquerors tonight? I have overcome. I said I have overcome. Uh, look at that. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Thank God that we have overcome today. I come to point number three now the fruits of sustained growth. As we're growing, we're going to sustain the growth. I said we're going to sustain the growth. The fruits of sustained growth towards maturity. Let's come back to Ephesians chapter 4 again. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, till we all come. How many of us are coming? I said how many of us are coming? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where we're growing. It says we ought to grow. And we're growing to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In uh, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 18. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But... Tell me, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To whom, to him be glory both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're talking about uh, sustained growth and the fruit of that, the evidence of that, the characteristics of that, and the marks of that. The fruit of sustained growth toward maturity. Number one, growth in unity. Growth in unity. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. It says, without lowliness and meekness, and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It said that unity is important in the church. That unity is important in the family. That unity is important in your personal life. And it says we grow in unity. What does that mean? First Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that she all speak the same thing. What are we to do? All speak the same thing. That 
there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let's grow in that. It's little, little children that argue about non-essentials. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to pick that up. Let uh, my brother pick it up. Let my sister. Those are little children. As we're maturing in the Lord, it says uh, an area of growth that comes in our lives is that now we're united and we grow in unity. Number two, we grow in faith. We grow in faith. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. We're to grow in that. In the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. Hebrews chapter 4. Reading from verse 2, if uh, we're not growing in faith, see what happens when you hear the word of God and you are not receiving that word of God with faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, it tells us here, for unto us what the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that had it. If you hear the word of God and it doesn't come with faith in your heart and you, you just throw it overboard and throw it over your shoulders and there's no faith to receive that word, no faith to stand on that word, no faith to make use of that word it profits you nothing. But when the word of God comes and you're growing in faith you're growing in faith, you're growing in faith that faith will mix with the word it will do great things in your life in Jesus name. And then it says we grow in knowledge grow in knowledge, come to uh, come to Second Peter again. Second Peter, chapter three, verse eighteen. But grow in grace and in the knowledge, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If I were to ask you about the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not knowledge about the Lord. It's the knowledge of the Lord. That is what He knows. What He knows for sure. And what he knows that is not shaking about it in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you growing in that? That you know this so much as Christ knew it. You know about the atonement so much as Christ knew it. You know about the efficacy of his blood as much as Christ himself knows it. And you are growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, we're growing. Before I go away from that, look at Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us, how many things? All things. Has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But how? I said, how would you know what belongs to you? How would you know your inheritance in Christ? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of only human nature? What kind of nature? Is the divine nature fearful of the devil? Afraid of demons? Afraid of occultic people? Afraid of going out? Afraid of, you know, this happened and this might happen to me? No evil will happen to you. I said no evil will happen to you. When you have that knowledge and you're growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that your life is secured. And as long as the promises of God are true, and thank God they're always true. They're true on my behalf. I said they're true on my behalf. And as long as they are true, Satan cannot touch your life. Yeah. If it tries, it will touch fire. Yeah. Because it says, now you are partakers of divine nature, having escaped. Thank God I escaped. I said, thank God I escaped. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. Now, look at, come back to that second uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Let me read the first uh, four words there. What are we to grow in? 
grow in grace, grow in grace, grow in grace. And as we grow in grace, you'll find every situation in your life. Think about that. The grace of God will be sufficient for you. No situation will ever come that the grace of God will not cover. No trial will ever come that the grace of God will not cover. No need will ever come that the grace of God will not cover. The only thing you need to do is to grow and grow and grow in grace. It's like, you know, I tell a child, I said, there's no exam you are going to take that you will not pass. He says, Pastor. The one I took uh, last uh, semester, I didn't uh, make it. I said, go back to that class because the knowledge is there. The teachers are there. The books are there. And the, all the things are there. It's just that to plug yourself into it again and plunge yourself into that. And then after that, take that exam again, uh, you are going to succeed. And I'm saying that maybe you failed in the past. Maybe you had challenges in the past. And you're saying, Pastor, I, I, I failed. I fell and this and that. I said, go back to the grace of God. Because the grace of God is sufficient. And next time, you will succeed. Next time, you will be on top in Jesus' name. You know, the thing is to close the door against the past. And to say, this is a new day. I have all the grace I need for today. And when tomorrow comes, you have all the grace you need for tomorrow because you are growing in grace. You are growing in grace. We're looking in at Second Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading here from verse 9. Just the first part of verse 9. Here it tells us, and, my, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. His grace is sufficient for you. Make it personal. Say it. Uh, let heavens hear. Convince yourself. It's sufficient for you. Thank God you will make it. I said, thank God you will make it. We, we cannot come together like this and go through all this word of God and then come out of this place and see be a failure impossible. I said it's impossible. He comes to give us grace. And he says when we need that grace, look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And I'm reading here from verse 16. It says, let us therefore come. How do we come? Timidly. As if we're orphans. As if, you know, I'm the worst person in the whole park. And now I come, God, is there anything for me? Do we come like that? It says, now, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of judgment, to the throne of condemnation. What kind of a throne? Where are you coming today? To the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Anybody there going to find that grace today? More grace. Greater grace. You will succeed in life. You will succeed in ministry. And as we look at you, I'll see you growing. You know, sometimes I think as I'm, you know, getting much older now. I not not old yet. Not I'm getting. I said I'm getting. So we, we need to understand grammar now. As I'm getting, uh, you know, older, when the time comes and I see there, grace abundant there, grace sufficient there, grace abounding there, I'll just sit back and just watch you succeed. Just watch you go out and then all those devil spirits there, you drive them away in Jesus' name. And then I'll be happy that I have not just two, not just ten, not just one hundred, not just one thousand, thousands and thousands of people that can do everything I have done. I pass it on to you. Receive it in Jesus' name. You will grow. Where are you? Stand up and tell the Lord, the grace of God is available. The power of God is available. And the Lord is fencing you around. Nothing can touch your life. Be bold and be aggressive. You are more than a conqueror. And move out in the grace of God. Success 
is in front of you. And remember, and remember the new converts, go to them and God will put the word in your mouth and they will do exploits like you in Jesus' name.